Good morning, everybody. Good morning. He is risen. Let's go. He is risen indeed, man. There's something always so special about Easter Sunday morning. I try to point out throughout the year that every Sunday is actually Resurrection Sunday. But man, there's just something different about Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, where you get up a little bit earlier. Uh, my kids are a little bit too big to do this, but you throw your kids a little bit higher in the air uh, on Easter Sunday morning, you put a little syrup on your waffles, whatever it is, uh, because man, this is such a special day. Uh, so yeah, for centuries, um, Christians have been joining and gathering like this and turning the volume up to 11 some mornings because man, he is alive, he is not a worldview. He's on an idea, but he is alive this morning. He's calling men and women unto himself even this morning. And so this is like so familiar for some of you, but we also recognize Easter Sunday morning uh, is a time where lots of guests are coming. And so maybe you came on the arm of a friend. And so if you're coming to my house, I'd want to be a good host. And so I'd want to make sure your, 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 uh, your jacket is in the closet and, you know, what can I get you to drink? And so for those of you who are guests here this morning, I want to just address some elephants in the room, okay? Some, some things that maybe you don't want to think about, but we need to talk about them. So I'm just trying to be a good host, okay? So at, when we think about Easter Sunday morning, I, I can see, there's lots, but I can see like three hesitations or three pushbacks for you, okay? And the first one uh, for those guests in the room is like an intellectual pushback to like the events of Easter Sunday morning, because what we're talking about this morning is actually a miracle claim that somebody who was dead became alive, Right, so at the center of Christianity is a miracle claim. And so for lots of people, there's like an intellectual barrier because you know that dead people do not become alive. So you're like, these poor people coming and singing these songs, like this doesn't happen. Why, what's the big deal, right? So I totally understand that. But I'd wanna say, if that's kind of your hesitation here is, man, you are right at home with the Bible because almost every single person in the Bible didn't believe the claim either because they knew that dead people didn't become alive either. And so there's a guy, an apostle, and his name is Thomas, and we know him as Doubting Thomas because he was a rational person and didn't believe the claim that dead people become alive. So you're right at home with a biblical witness. The question that I'd wanna ask you, and there's only two responses to this question, is just this. Um, Has or does the universe, like all that we see, all that is present, has and does the universe sustain and cre- create and sustain itself, okay? Has and does the universe create and sustain itself? There's two answers to that question. The first one is yes, it does. That the universe does create and sustain itself. If that's your answer to the question, then simply you're right, miracles cannot happen. They just can't because all we see is what exists. There's nothing outside of that. The other option to that question is to say, no, that the universe has not created and does not sustain itself, whether that's a higher power, whether that's a being beyond our consciousness, whatever it is, all right? The other answer is no, that the universe has not and does not sustain itself. And if that's your answer, you've actually opened the door to a God that can come into human history and do things, Okay, and here's what I'd point out. If your answer is yes, that you you don't believe that a God can exist, I would just simply say, regardless of your answer to the question, that both of them are faith positions. They're both faith positions because whether you say yes or no to that, that question, it's a faith position. There's no demonstrable experiment that would be able to get you to the answer. They're both faith positions. That's the first objection, it's intellectual, it's in your brain, I don't know if I like this. The second one is emotional. It's an emotional objection to today. You're like, I'm fine with Jesus and stuff. That's cool. But Christians and the church, ugh, ugh, man, I don't, I don't like it. So you pinpoint like a, a, an era in church history that you just don't like. You're like, ugh, I don't really like this. Or you pinpoint your neighbor who's just a jerk and pretends or claims to follow Jesus. And so you come in here like, I'm fine with Jesus, but the church, ugh, I'm not, not so sure. And Christians themselves are just terrible people. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, I understand. There are lots of times in church history where, where the church has got it wrong. There, I can't talk to you about your neighbor. Maybe they, they are a jerk. I'm not really sure, but there are absolutely. And the times that the church or Christians have not measured up to Jesus Christ and his love and his ministry, we need to acknowledge, repent of all of those things. But I'd leave you with just with this. Summertime on Shushwap Lake, you jump into one part of it, it is cold and uninviting. Oh, it's freezing, you wanna get up but you just go around the corner and you jump in in that section and it's warm and it's inviting and on a a hot summer day, the temperature is so nice in that part. One of them is cold, the other area 
is warm. One is uninviting, the other is inviting. Think of Christianity like that. Some parts of and histories and people of Christianity are cold and uninviting, you want no part of. But guys, some people in this room love Jesus, love our city, sacrifice themselves. They are warm and inviting, so don't discount the whole thing because of a few bad actors. The third objection, the third objection. It's not intellectual, it's not emotional. It's what we call existential. It's dealing with your existence. And this objection just sounds like this. Um, fine with Jesus, church, whatever, um, but I'm really not sure I'd want Jesus to come and change my life. Like, I, I, I pray when I can. I don't really come to church. I'd like to keep Jesus at an arm's distance because I'm afraid that if Jesus comes into my life, it's gonna wreck everything, and I got a good, I got a good thing going. So why would I want Jesus to actually come in and do this? Easter, Christmas, yes, 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 but no more. I don't know if you caught it, but there was a guy, somebody, a guy or girl, uh, in New Jersey this week who won the fifth largest lotto of all time, $1.13 billion. His tough decision this week was whether he wants a lump sum or paid every month. I mean, like, what are you going to do, right? So, so imagine how this person's life is going to change because of this amount of money. And we perceive it, and it's studies show otherwise, but we're not getting into that. Uh, we perceive this to be the best change in the entire world. Think of all that he could do now because of this. If Jesus is alive this morning, if, if he is not an idea, he is not a worldview, but he is alive and resurrected and calling you unto himself, my friends, you've won the lottery. And the change that comes to your life is not in the negative, but think about all that you could do if this is actually true and your life could change. And so what we're gonna do for the remainder of our time, we're gonna look at the, the end of the story from Peter. We talked about Peter on Good Friday, and we're gonna finish with this amazing reinstatement of Peter. And what we're gonna see is Peter as an exemplar or as an example of what Jesus, the risen Christ, can do in a human life. And we're gonna go out of John chapter 21. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm gonna walk you through this. And we're gonna see two things. What is possible? If Jesus is alive today, what is possible in the human life? There's two things I wanna show you. The bulk of our time, I'm gonna show you one thing is that you are loved unconditionally. You are loved unconditionally. And number two, there is a purpose and a meaning in your life that nothing can take away. John 21 says this. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. This is what we call a post-resurrection appearance. He is now moved from Jerusalem up north into Galilee. It says, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Seven disciples up in the Galilee. Verse three, Peter says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we will go with you. Here we meet Peter. Peter is the guy who just denied Jesus three times. He said boldly, no matter what happens, I'm going to the death with you no matter what. A little girl, a little girl comes to Peter and says, hey, I think you're with Jesus. He's like, no, I'm not. I don't know who you're talking about, what you're talking about. A little girl, he freaks out over this and denies Jesus three times. Here we see Peter. This is the first time that John has mentioned Peter after this moment. And Peter, my friends, is not in a good place. His dreams are shattered. He left everything to follow Jesus. As far as he can tell, Jesus is crucified. It's over. There's a loss of identity. His life has collapsed in on itself. So what does Peter do? He goes back to what he knows. I, I guess, I guess I'm gonna go fish. Here we meet Peter at the lowest point of his life. And I love what he says. At the lowest, most awful part of his life, what does he say? I'm going fishing. That's some of you here, right? You got a bad day at work? I'm going fishing, all right? So he calls the lads. Hey, boys, we're going out. We're gonna go fish. And this is what they do. At the end of verse three, it says this. I went out to fish, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night, they caught nothing. Skunked, all right? In the original language, what, what happens here is the word nothing is emphasized, and they caught nothing. In other words, here's Peter, the failure again. The thing that he thinks he can do, he can't even do. He's a failure. This is Peter, the failure. Matthew 16, Jesus pronounces, Peter, I'm gonna build the church on you. 
He's like, okay, good. A few verses later, he has this other interaction with Jesus. And, and Jesus is talking about his cross and, and what's gonna happen, and Pete doesn't like that. Pete's like, no, I don't like this whole thing. And Jesus calls him Satan. Like, that's a low point. In your life, if Jesus calls you Satan, it can't get worse than that, okay? <laughs> John 13, just a few chapters before this. All right, Jesus is gonna wash the disciples' feet. Pete's like, ah, I'm not sure, you, need, you don't need to wash mine. And Jesus is like, look, if I don't wash your feet, you have no place with me. Eh, gets it wrong again. A few verses after that, Jesus again, talking about his cross. Pete doesn't like the cross. You just get, I, I want you to be victorious. I don't really like this whole cross thing. And, and then he says, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna go and die. And Pete's like, well, if that happens, I'm gonna be with you no matter what. And then Jesus is like, no, no, actually, that's not gonna happen. You're actually gonna betray me and disown me three times before the rooster crows, and, and, and then it happens. And then Jesus gets arrested, and, and Pete knows all this sort of stuff, and the person that's arresting Jesus, he takes out his sword and cuts off the ear of a guy named Malchus. And Jesus is like, oh, now I gotta heal this guy's ear. Like, what is wrong with you, Pete? Like, Pete is a field. He can't do anything right, and here he can't even catch fish. This is the state of Peter. Peter, the failure. When I was growing up, uh, my, my birthday's in November, and so, Growing up, uh, my parents held me back a year, so I was the oldest in my class. And that was actually really embarrassing a lot because people were like, how, why, were you, did you fail? Like, what happened? And so I, I would always have to say, no, like, I didn't fail. I, I'm, you know. But w when it actually came through was the year that I could get my license before everybody. <laughs> and so I remember my, my parents bought, like, a driving set of le uh, lessons for driving, and I was in this white K car with the red cloth interior. You remember those cars? Just an ugly, ugly, ugly piece of machinery. And so I, get all, I go to my examination, but before my exam, everybody knows in my, in my class because they're like, finally, Thronus is gonna get his license so he can drive us all around, right? So I, I book the appointment. I'm in the car with the examiner. We do the hand things and the signals. And she's like, what I want you to do is I want you to pull out and I want you to go into the entrance and exit way and I'll tell you what to do. Fine, reverse. I pull out into the exit and entrance way of the ICBC office in Kelowna. As I'm pulling into the entrance and exit way of the parking lot, a huge Cadillac comes in at the exact same time and I freak out. And I put that white K car onto the curb and I fail immediately. <laughs> he said, just do around the block and come back. And I remember, guys, I remember driving back to my high school thinking, what am I gonna say to people? <laughs> because everybody knows I'm going for the test. How did it go? I failed in the parking lot. <laughs> That's how it went. And it's fun to joke about driving tests, but there's some times in our lives where like our failures have been catastrophic, right? Like the, the divorce. And you're like, I don't want anybody to know. I don't want anybody to hear. What if they found out? We think about the relationship breakdown. We think about the secrets. We think about the things that have been done to you that have made you feel like a failure, even though you have done nothing wrong. We think about these things that really shape the human experience. Like nobody in this room, whether, whether you've been successful or not in your life, we've all known the pain of failure and this is where we meet Peter. This is him. What ends up happening is Jesus says, hey boys, Jesus comes post-resurrection, says, hey boys, put the net on the other side, they get a whole lot of fish. Verse seven, we pick up the story. It says, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So John says, hey, it's Jesus. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. There is something about Jesus that after all that has happened, after all of the disowning, after all of the shame, that when Peter realizes it's Jesus who is resurrected from the grave. He jumps in to go to see him. And my thought is, in the moment of failure and shame, you actually don't want to see that person. You wanna run away. I don't want to own up. I don't wanna have to face it. But what is it about Jesus that Peter knows his reaction could be different? It goes on. It says, Verse eight, the other disciples followed in the boat, 
towing the full net of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Another objection that you could have to the events of today is like, ah, the Bible. I mean, how do we even trust the Bible? It's old and ancient. This is silly. Why would you trust this? Guys, how far away was the boat from shore? John gives us detail, a hundred yards. How many fish did he catch? We're going to see 153. How many times has Jesus appeared? John gives us a detail, three times. I'm pointing out that these are details that only an eyewitness would have of the events themselves. My friends, you can trust what has been recorded by this eyewitness. Then it says in verse nine, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. The term burning coals. The last time that John gave us a detail like that was in John 18, 18. That was the first, after the first denial of Peter to Jesus Christ. And it says, John gives us this this detail, that there was a fire of burning coals that people were warming themselves around. And here's what John is doing. He's linking Peter's greatest failure to now his reinstatement. That's something Around a fire is where he actually denies, and around a fire is where he's going to actually feel something different. Jesus said to them in verse 10, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter goes, it says it was, it was a full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not broken. In verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. Here, Peter, Peter the failure, experiences the radical hospitality of Jesus Christ. Love. No matter what. In spite and despite of all of Peter's shortcomings. Like, Peter's found out to be a fraud. And what does Jesus do? Chastise? How dare you? No. Come and eat. And he provides the meal. What radical love. Brené Brown is a psychologist. She's done lots of work on the idea of shame. And here's what she defines shame as. An intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed of, and unworthy of love and belonging. An intense feeling that we do not belong. That if we were found out, people would actually leave. In another place, she says, if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three ingredients to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. In other words, in for, for you to maximize the feeling of hiding, I'm a fraud, I'm unworthy, what needs to happen is secrecy. Don't tell anybody. Silence. Zip it, no one's allowed to address this. And judgment, you feel judged because of that moment, that decision, that failure, whatever it is. That's when, she says, shame grows exponentially. And what does shame do? It makes you hide. What if people knew who I actually was? That's what shame does to someone. So when I think about, think about that drive to Okanagan Mission Secondary School after I failed my driver's test. I didn't want to say anything to anybody. I wanted to melt. Secrecy. Silence. Because what what, what would people think? What an idiot. He failed in the parking lot. (laughs) So think about that, but just just apply it to your thing you're thinking about right now. Here's, Here's what Brown says. If you put the same amount of shame in the Petri dish and douse it with empathy, it can't survive. Did you hear that? Put the exact same moment, the exact same shame in the Petri dish and douse it with empathy, it won't survive. Jesus and his hospitality douses your shame with empathy. Because if he is resurrected from the grave, He is big enough and strong enough to take the shame that has bound you into that cellar. And as he bleeds out on a cross, the most shameful death available to humankind, he takes that moment, that shame, that hiddenness upon himself. 
and he is buried in the tomb. And this morning he rose from the dead and he leaves your shame in that grave. And so that today it's not secrecy, silence, and judgment. He knows, he loves, and he is making you breakfast. Come to me. This is the hope of Jesus Christ. There's a professor who's serving in the Midwest states right now. Her name is Auburn Sandstorm. But she wasn't always this professional. She shares a story in a collective work, a book. The book is called The The Moth Presents All These Wonders, True Stories About Facing the Unknown. And this is a story that happened to her. It was 1992. She was 29 years old. She had just finished a master's degree abroad and had come back and was really passionate about social justice and she got married very quickly and the person that she married introduced her to a drug. So she's 29, she's curled up in the fetal position on a filthy carpet, going through withdrawal symptoms from the drug that she is addicted to. Not only that, but her anxiety attack is skyrocketing. Her husband is actually out on the streets trying to find the very drug that she is addicted to. What makes this moment even more painful for Auburn Sandstorm is the fact that her baby boy is sleeping in another room. And she feels the failure and the shame of her addiction and the state of her life. It was two in the morning and Auburn thinks desperately to reach out to somebody. She remembers that her mother gave her a little crumpled up piece of paper with a number and the name of a Christian counselor. And so at two in the morning, Auburn phones this person. Hello? She can hear the person on the other end of the line kind of ruffle in bed. Hi, hi, how, how, are, you, how are you doing? And, and she says, do you think you could talk to me? The person on the other end of the line says, yes, of course, what, what's going on? And for hours, Auburn Sandstrom just talks about her life, her bad marriage, her drug addiction, her child sleeping in the other room, the shame, the failure of this moment in her life. That person on the other end of the line just sat and listened to her. Wow, that's really hard. I can't imagine what that's like. Tell me more. And is present with her as she is in the dark night. This person stayed up with her the entire night and Auburn Sandstorm's anxiety and withdrawal attack actually subsided to the point where she said, okay, you're a Christian counselor, now it's your time to tell me a Bible verse or something, I can take it. And the person said, no, 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 I'm I'm not here for that. So full of gratitude, she says, I really appreciate you and what you've done for me tonight. How long have you been a Christian counselor? It's a long pause on the other end of the line. Auburn, please don't hang up. I'm so afraid to tell you this. You got the wrong number. (laughs) I'm not a therapist. I've just really enjoyed talking to you tonight. This is what she says. I didn't hang up on him. I never got his name. I never spoke to him again. But the next day, I felt like I was shining. I discovered that there was this completely random love in the universe, that it could be unconditional. And some of it was for me. And it also became possible for a teetotaling single parent to raise up that precious baby boy into a magnificent young scholar and athlete who graduated from Princeton with honors. In the deepest and darkest, blackest night of despair, if you can just get one pinhole of light, all grace can rush in. Don't you see? If Jesus is alive and resurrected today, taking your sin and your shame upon himself, It's not just a pinhole of light that can rush into your life. It's an overwhelming array that can come and meet you to have breakfast with Jesus Christ. You you may have objections to this, but I'm telling you, you want this to be true. You want this to be true. So I think like resurrection morning, just the question is, you don't have to hide. You don't have to believe the script anymore. That love is unconditional. I get it, like especially for guests coming on Easter Sunday, it's just like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that I'm gonna burn up in here. No, 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 no. Here's a meal. Come. Come. No matter what. 
what Jesus does next is he continues a conversation with Peter in the same way that Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus asked him a question three times. Peter, do you love me more than these? And for like centuries, scholars have been trying to understand, what are these? Is it the fish? Is it the disciples? Is it the boat? What are these? Nobody knows. But he's getting at, he's getting at Peter's loves. Do you love me more than these? In comparison to these things, is your love for me more than that? See, if Jesus is resurrected from the grave this morning and is welcoming you to himself, he's not looking to just change your outer behaviors, all the outside stuff, because without changing the heart, what you're doing is mowing over weeds. They're just gonna grow back up. But if Jesus can get to your loves, your life can transform. And then here's what he does. Is he says to Peter three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep feed my sheep. See, what was lost in Peter's denial is reinstated. Because what he's saying is, I want, you to, I want you to take care of the people that I love. And, and he does. He does. He takes care of them. He plants churches. He writes letters. The one who is afraid of a little girl is the one in whom will be crucified upside down himself. That's the end of the story for Peter. If Jesus is alive today, he can give meaning and purpose to your life that nothing can take away. And in our diluted, binge-watching, addicted to screens, world where we live passionless and from one escape to the next, I am telling you, there is a purpose and a meaning given to you by the resurrection of Jesus to a new life unto himself that nothing can take away. This is what you need. So my friend, I'm gonna finish with this. My friend, Norm McCallum, uh, he is an indigenous elder. He's on our staff team. Uh, and Norm is spending resurrection Sunday morning in a hospital bed in Six North. I went to see him yesterday. Guys, you can't stop this guy. He's telling everybody about Jesus from his hospital bed this morning. So here's the thing. You can have localized meaning. I just want to be a good person and I want to have a good inheritance for my kids and all that sort of stuff. But, but here's the thing, is that that meaning shrivels in suffering and Norm is suffering today and his meaning is just as strong as ever. If Jesus is resurrected today, there's two things available to you. Think about the possibility of your life. You've won the lottery. The first thing is that you are unconditionally loved no matter what and he is welcoming you to himself today. The second thing is that there is a meaning and a purpose unto him that will never be taken away, no matter what. So we're gonna sing a song. I'd invite you to stand.
moment after this interaction with Jesus where he reinstates him and feed my lambs and Jesus in verse 19 of John 21 says to Peter follow me follow me it's like I, I, I have but there's a re-invitation to do so so what we want to do is we want to give you an opportunity to respond and if you're like oh no high pressure religious environment until you know it's not gonna be like that it's really not at all um, but we do want to give you an opportunity, like any invitation that you get. Yes, no, or just don't respond, that's okay. But we do wanna give you an opportunity. There's a whole bunch of different steps that you can take. And one of the things you need to know as a church is like our greatest privilege, like our mission as a church is to serve people. <laughs> that's why we exist. We just wanna serve anybody and everybody who would trust us. So whether it's reading to kids at Arthur Hatton Elementary School during the week, whether it's inviting the marginalized into our emergency weather shelter, whether it's on Thursday night, we invite a whole bunch of teenagers, most of them have no faith background at all, into our building to wreck it and put dents into the walls. We love it. That's why we exist as a church. And so this is an opportunity for us to come alongside you in your space. And it'd be a privilege to do so. And so there's a little card. If you're in the base, basement, yeah, bottom floor, uh, basement, whatever, you know where you are. Um, there's a little card in, in, the, in the little, oh my goodness, in the chair in front of you. Uh, you can take that out. You don't have to. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can take it out. Also, in the balcony, there's going to be some people. I can't see because of the lights, but they're going to be passing. They are, yeah, they're, I see movement. There are humans up there. Um, they're going to just pass a, a basket up there, and there's a card with a pencil. And there's six kind of options on there. The first one is, I've decided to follow Jesus today. So maybe, maybe there is this moment that you've been searching for a long time and you've been, you know, your hesitations. You went to Alpha, you've done these sorts of things. And, and really on Easter Sunday morning, there's a great moment for you to say, yeah, I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge my rebellion. I acknowledge that I have not made Jesus my core identity in my life. So there's an acknowledgement and then a, and a receiving. Yeah, I, I receive what you did on the cross and what Easter Sunday morning means. And so if that's you, you can just check off, I decide to follow Jesus. The second was I wanna get baptized. Maybe this morning you're like, man, if Jesus can get out of the tomb, I can get into the tank and get baptized. And so if that's you, you can write that down and we'll, we'll follow up. Thirdly, I wanna grow in my faith. Maybe there, you just feel stuck, feel stuck. You don't really come, you do what you can, but you feel stuck, you can check that off. Fourth is I wanna get into a life group in a lonely culture. One of the main contributions of the church is to provide places for people. We want you to come, we want you to join. So we got groups all over our city that would love to have you this week in their living room with a apple pie. Life group leaders, you now have to serve apple pie this week. <laughs> Fifthly, 
and I have questions or I'd like more information. Man, I love hard conversations and hard questions. I, I would love it to have a conversation with you. Like, yeah, what about? And what about? And what about this flaw? Man, I would love to talk. I, maybe I won't be the one to follow up with you, but I would love to, and we would love to be able to walk you through that. And then finally, I would like someone to pray for me. And your, your world is shrinking and it's hard right now. We would love to do that. And so uh, our commitment to you, just so you're aware, is uh, we're gonna store this really, really, really well. Your information will not get out. And our elders, our senior leaders, our top leaders of our church will phone you by Wednesday. You will get a phone call by Wednesday just to follow up and say, how, how can we serve you? A privilege to be let in. How, how do we serve you? So what, what I would ask is just fill out your name, your phone number, and your email clearly. So Because some of you can do this but no one can read it, not even Jesus. And so we want, we want you to write it down so people can read it, uh, and then we will, we will get in touch with you. What's gonna happen is after you leave, there's gonna be some people standing there with baskets. You can just drop that card in, uh, and upstairs there are baskets as you go out in, in the two doors. But again, no pressure. But we do know, I do know, that Jesus all the time is calling people to himself because he is not a worldview, he is not an idea. He is alive this morning, and maybe this morning something has changed for you. So again, why don't we stand up and sing one last song?